So I think this is some, um, it's, it's going to be a story, not, not going to be a panel um, story that, uh, uh, you know, is in, in a way, it's a segue to, uh, to what was discussed. And um, so we go, right? Yeah. So maybe uh, some people are still walking in. We just wait for a minute or two. And Dirk mentioned that uh, next talk is going to be free or like 15 minutes or just something like that or? Okay. Okay, then I think then let, let's, let's get it started. So uh, this is again, um, it leads back to my own personal story. And um, I'm Arvind, I'm natively from uh, Sri Lanka. And um, I was born in a time um, where several uh, family members in my family were killed as a collateral damage uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the war. And um, somehow I ended up in the country, even though like majority of our family members migrated to many countries uh, in global north. And um, there was this, uh, you know, so I, my life was every day growing up in a, in a war zone, living with that thing. And uh, it's, uh, when I was 14 years old, um, there was a situation, you know, that the war was going for more than 20 years. So the, the, the longer the war, younger the soldier. So at the time, when I was 14 years old, I was uh, in a situation to become a child soldier. And um, so there's no way that I can stay in the country. So I escaped uh, the country and become as a child refugee in another country for quite some time, 10 years of my life uh, away from the family. So when I went back, uh, when the war ended in 2009, I went back um, to Sri Lanka after 10 years, and I saw that this uh, three decades of uh, civil war caused a huge damage on the socio-economic and environmental systems. As you can see, the um, country became one of the least innovative countries and has a huge negative trade balance, and uh, we were kind of losing 400 elephants every year. This is the highest number in the world. Um, because of human wild elephant conflict. The international aids provide a significant, you know, as you can see in you know, every, every country in the global south, they have a lot of international uh, NGOs and organization, but they couldn't solve the local challenges very sustainably. So I was really thinking, okay, how I can, you know, empower these locals, and, and then I came up with this idea. So the only way to solve these local challenges is to empower the locals to solve these ch uh, local challenges. So since 2013, we were acting in the country as a peace building and reconciliation organization. And then we changed that organization into a, into a, into a non yeah, social enterprise or as a community innovation center to tackle these local socioeconomic and environmental challenges through challenge-based learning and grassroots innovations and building you know, impact ventures. Because uh, in a country where it was uh, 30 years of war, you cannot just go and create startup as you would do in Berlin because there's no infrastructure, there's no knowledge, there's no innovation. So then, then we decided, okay, for whom we want to do it and why we want to do it. And it's mainly because, you know, to, to, for the underserved communities in the war-affected regions of Sri Lanka and to protect the environmental ecosystem and also to, you know, keep doing the peace building and reconciliation work and to create sustainable startups. So, unlike, uh, you know, uh, normal NGOs or social enterprises, we have a different way of working that we always had a social mission and a business venture. So, whatever we did in our business side, we always funnel back all of our money to our social mission. We are a non-profit organization so that we can sustain and keep doing this. So, the main focus uh, of our social mission is that we call it personalized empowerment. As you know, that everyone is a different person and then you cannot have a one solution for all, right? One size does not fit all. So, we developed this model called Dream Space Lifecycle, which is a five uh, stage process similar to a company building, entrepreneur building, uh, you know, incubation process you can see, but it goes for like more than two years, more than 18 months. So I will tell you with a with small story how we do that. So um, we uh, look for candidates when they are 16, 17 years old from the war affected regions. And, uh, and then at the time we looked like, you know, how do we discover them? We look at, uh, you know, what kind of motivation they have. For example, Sanjeevan, he was about promoting the uh, environmental uh, protection. And he walked from the north to the south tip of Sri Lanka through the forest for, you know, for, for 500 kilometers uh, to promote national peace. And he became the, the first Sri Lankan Tamil teenager to, to, you know, to climb Mount Elbrus. And then we saw that he has this great motivation to solve uh, socio-economic and environmental challenge, but he does not have the skills uh, necessary infrastructure in Sri Lanka. So when we identify, discover the candidate, 
we bring them into a stage. This is when we do exactly when they finish the school. In Sri Lanka, when they finish a school, between school and then the university, they have minimum of one and a half year gap for everyone because there's not enough uh, universities for everyone and it takes system is very slow. And this is the time usually these youngsters from the, you know, the underserved communities, they are kind of drifted away and then spoiled and they would go to Middle East, become a labor worker, would never come back. And this is where they lose their future and then they, they live, you know, they continue to live the way they, they live. So in this stage, we just bring them in. Incubation, that means that we take them out of their family. So we have to, you know, provide an accommodation for, accommodation for them. We have to feed them. We have to keep them because we, the family influences everything. So we have to make sure that we can, you know, keep you know, them in with us for, for this process, for this incubation period. So in the second stage, what we do, we identify, like, basically, like, with everyone is coming from every uh, different location in, in Sri Lanka. So if you look at coastal villages, they have a certain ocean-related issues. If we have, like, a borderline jungle villages, we have, like, people where, have, where we have, like, a human-wild-elephant conflict. As I said, we lose 400 elephants a year. At the same time, we lose 85, 85 people in a, in a yearly in Sri Lanka die because of human-wild-elephant conflict. So each of them comes with a different challenge, and what we do based on that challenge challenge, we personalize their training. That's why we call it a challenge-based learning. We don't do subject-based learning. We don't do project-based learning. We do challenge-based learning. And then we build them from non-technical skills to technical skills, something like storytelling to biotechnology in multiple interdisciplines. And once we identify what they are good in that, they are still under 20, what we basically do Based on the challenge, we start to create an innovation. But basically, the candidate creates. So, as you see, this is my hometown in Batiklo. Uh, it's called Bat it's ba it's called Batiklo in, in the east of Sri Lanka. We are surrounded by uh, you know really a lot of water backwaters in the ocean. Our city was called as a city of singing fish during the colonial time. Why? Because we have a certain aquatic creature in our backwater which used to make a noise which sounded like a song. And during the colonial time, a British uh, ecologist that they in BBC it was recorded and they played and they and then they they say there are, that, you know, in a way that this region is highly biodiverse. We have a very certain species of you know ocean species, marine species, native species around the region. There have been also been you know bio biodiversity uh, degradation. So we need a system that can actually monitor what's happened underwater. So there are such systems existing, but in a country like us, uh, you know, in Sri Lanka and in a community like us, we cannot afford to buy the system. So Sanjeevan is identified, you know, he identified the challenge. He started developing a grassroots innovation that would be, you know, solving and tackling this challenge. So in the fourth stage, you know, we started with so many disciplines from storytelling, software, and mechanics, and whatever it is. And then now we identify that candidate actually wants to work in ocean biology, and we don't have a resource for that in, in our, you know, ecosystem. So what we do, we connect these, uh, you know, usually there are experts and scientists fly from Europe or from the global north to Sri Lanka and stay with us and then train, and train us and the candidates as well as our trainers on the topic so that we build that capacity. At the same time, we also send the candidates to another international research center where they can actually, you know, get this knowledge very quickly because, you know, we have only like two years of time. So, for example, in Sanjeevan's case, we presented this story to Plokan. This is the Oceanic Research Center in the middle of Atlantic Ocean. As you can see, they have a lot of, uh, you know, equipment that can, you know, profile the whole Atlantic Ocean. So, what you see on this side, this is in their glider, which is 200,000 euro glider, which will glide for, you know, four to six months from this side of you know, Atlantic to the other side to collect all different types of underwater data. And our glider is open source and, and which costs around 2,000 euro, 100 times cheaper. And it's open source, you know, it can be upgradable, you know, it can be repaired. And the community is not like only in Sri Lanka, but like other countries and other regions in the global south can actually access this technology easily than these, uh, uh, these uh, um, you know, expensive products. The last stage, as we said, like, you know, it's not just enough to keep, uh, you know, make some innovations and put it in a shelf. We have to actually make some uh, startups and organization out of it so that we can do that long, you know, and in a long, sustainable way. So in that stage, we train the candidates with all that that's necessary from business modeling, financial modeling, company formation, legal, whatever that's necessary. They are still under 20. So it's all happening within two years of time. And then, and then s candidates like Sanju, when they went on to several international and national SDG startup competition, pitched and then won several prize money. And also we take the prototype and we 
pilot it with the, the relevant stakeholders. For example, Asha is the only marine mammal biologist of Sri Lanka who is protecting uh, the blue whales of the region. As you know, the blue whales are the biggest organism in the world, and the biggest of all the blue whales are in our water, in the Sri Lankan, the northern Indian water. So she is protecting them, and then she has to dive and collect a lot of underwater data, but if she has such a solution, it would help her to you know, fasten up this conservation process. So that is how we at the stage that we know that now this idea, this, this solution, this candidate can be graduated, so it's around a two years of time, and then we build an organization, either it's a startup for profit, non-profit initiative, it's all candidates' uh, decision, and then we build the organization and graduate. So with this process, we are not only creating a change maker, but we are also building an industry that does not exist in this country. For example, if someone studies oceanology in Sri Lanka, the maximum respectable job they can get is a clerical job in a bank. So because of that, you know, there are not opportunities. A lot of youngsters are going, you know, other places, other countries, and then becoming asylum seekers. With this way, we can make sure that such industries can be in 5, 10, 20 years, can mature, and these youngsters, they don't have to become asylum seekers in the global north or like, you know, labor workers in Middle East. And this is, is a true uh, sustainable development goal, uh, you know, for us. So in these last uh, many years, what we have done, we have uplifted more than 500 youngsters and built like nine labs and then, you know, 11 innovation, which I will show, and then so many, several initiatives and ventures were spun off. And we also won several achievements in medal, and we, are the, we hold 23 Duke of Edinburgh awards, medals, and we are the, one of the, the organizations that holds that many awards in, in one place. So... I would quickly just go through a little bit on the back behind the scenes. How do we do? Basically, we, uh, you know, we find a local challenge, you know, create, look for open innovation because we cannot do the fundamental research in a country like where there is no such infrastructure. We have to always do like already existing open innovation, do R&D and find a way to locally produce and go to market go to market. And Sanjeevan is not the only candidate. We have several candidates in several projects. As you can see here, you see on the, on the side, Abhinaya, this biofilter. When we identified her, she was 16 years old from a very borderline village where there's nothing. And she actually has developed a biofilter to remove cadmium pollution just by grinding the seeds of java plum. If you are from that region, South and Southeast Asia, you know this is a commonly available fruit. So basically what she created is an organic, nano organic nanotechnology to, to tackle a challenge in a community. And if they, we have to go to, a, you know, to a international aid and they would actually put like multiple millions or billions of doll, dollars of taxpayers' money to, to find a nanotechnology company to solve, but they could actually find solutions in their, in their native, in their environment. So like that we have in synthetic biology, we have gas, uh, renewable gas, and we have like, you know, electromechanical products and, um, you know, AI, and uh, we have been working on biocomposite material. We actually, during the corona time, we actually developed a rapid test kit, which has been approved by the government. It's been used in Sri Lanka. And this is one innovation that comes from a community innovation center. So that also proves that. Yeah, that also proves that we can actually, it does, it does not mean that, you know, innovation has to only come from corporates and, and like, you know, research institutions and, and like, you know, big techs or like startups from the global north. It can also come from organizations like ours. So as I said, we have multiple labs from storytelling, peace building to electronics, mechanics and biotechnology and... Um, and so on, so uh, like around 14 labs. So as I said, we have used to have a lot of experts who fly, who flew to Sri Lanka, I mean, during this time it was difficult, and to build our team and then to give that capacity, and with this, this is how we build that you know, multidisciplinary capacity. But we still keep doing our peace building, well-being advocacy. We do lo a lot of fine arts and you know, media, video creations, content creations, rural empowerment, women empowerment, youth empowerment, peace building and reconciliation because this is what we have to always keep doing it for probably for another 30, 40 years in a country that just, you know, recover, recovering from the war. And uh, there are several uh, uh, ventures uh, uh, spun off uh, from uh, Dream Space in green economy, blue economy, bioeconomy, women empowerment, uh, hate speech mitigation, and so on. And we have been, you know, getting a lot of international appreci appreciations awards uh, uh, for our work, and also been featured by, uh, you know, na international media quite a lot. And we still don't have much recognition locally in the country, but we are trying to to achieve that. And uh, this is a, you know, I really have to tell this because this team, that you, this is one, you know, small part of our team. We are a very big team. If you look at the names and the faces and their appearances, we are the 
one of the very few organizations in the war-affected regions of Sri Lanka where every ethnic and religious divides of Sri Lanka are working together. They are even moving from the capital of the country to a remote town because what we are providing is not even existing in the capital. So we are changing, we change the narrative that you can do everything in Sri Lanka, you don't have to go to a foreign country, but we are even changing the narrative. You don't have to go to a capital city, you can do where you are. This, you know, so they have been united by this passion for science and technology and innovation. This is a true peace building for us than a billion dollar international aid uh, funds. And uh, we have a lot of... and hundreds of them, and this is how we also build such a high technical and scientific capacity. So people ask, you know, just as a, you know, end of the story, so how do you be a part of a, such a non-profit organization which is completely different from other organizations, uh, and then we create innovation, so you can be in many ways, you can be, you know, personal engagement like these subject matter experts. There are some organizations, they say that, okay, we want to give you impact investment. There are some organizations, they said, okay, let's work together on a project. You know, for example, last year, Australian Aid uh, reached out and they said, okay, we want to give you 25,000 euros, and we created 27 storytellers around ecotourism because this is their mandate, Australian Aid's mandate, and each of them actually during the, work, the COVID time, created their own digital studio and digital marketing businesses. And then it's not only just they just learned the skill, but they also created a business for themselves to sustain and to uplift their communities. So we have a lot of internal capacity, technical, non-technical capacities. We started giving as a service for national and international clients. This way we can also funnel all these service costs to our social mission. And a lot of people are like, you know, being an ambassador and supporting us uh, in many ways. So. This is basically about our story, and um, uh, if you really want to be a part of this story in some way, and then if you want to co-create the dreams of these underserved communities, not only in Sri Lanka, anywhere in the world, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you. Sorry, I had to leave uh, to 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 manage another stage here. It's it's <laughs> a lots of things at the same time going on. But actually, the cool thing is we have some time left. So if you're up for it, I would like to ask you a, a couple of questions. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you told us a little bit about your personal uh, history. Mm -hmm. uh, is it sometimes hard for you to you know to if you look at the other guys to see what kind of position they're in. I mean, maybe sometimes it also can, can be a, a bit emotional, right? Mm -hmm. Or do you feel like, okay, this is, this is such, so connected to who I am that you will always have the energy to, to push this forward? Yeah, I mean, 24 years of my life has been this, you know, being a war child or, you know, almost about to become a child soldier and a child refugees away from the family. And I didn't know like what what is what is my purpose in my life in, the, in all this time. So when I went back and then I when I saw that you know there are so many uh, youngsters not only in Sri Lanka until till now in different parts of the world going through the same challenges. So the and then it took really several years because I was also like I had around seven years of suicidal depression because I was stuck as a ghost in the system as a child refugee in another country where they didn't allow me to go to school, they didn't allow me to go to university and then when I find a way they didn't allow me to go to job and they didn't give me a home to live and on the first year of my life they threw out nine landowners threw me out of the house calling me a terrorist because I was just a child you know and uh, but then uh, it took a lot of time. <laughs> you, <laughs> you think maybe that if I talk fast then <laughs> It doesn't impact uh, the, the, the audience too much, but that yeah. this is a lot to... Yeah. yeah. But, oh, okay, continue. Yeah. So that, that's how, like, you know, after going, I, I had a certain period of time when I moved. I mean, everything, you know, it's Asia Berlin Summit. I actually recovered from this in Berlin, you know, after I moved uh, to Berlin. Berlin kind of, you know, uplifted me and then gave this direction, and that's how I am doing what, you know, this all that what I do is, is like what I learned in Berlin. And... Um, um, yeah, so uh, in 2019, I, I spoke about this uh, in a big stage. We won this award, if you know about Falling Walls Award. This is one of the prestigious awards for the si science engagement. We were the grand winner of that in 2019. And the publisher reached out to me and they asked me, can I write a book about it? Mm -hmm. Two years I've been writing this book. And on 16th of October, this book is going to be published. 
And all the sales costs you can buy it in Amazon is going to go to Penn International. It's a charity uh, where they support uh, jailed, imprisoned writers. So this is going to happen. So if, if you are interested, you know, it's going to be shifting the lines, you know, the, the, the book's name. And, um, and if you are interested, I can give you a link. You can just support. Every that cost goes to a lot of writers uh, who are going through the same challenges. Yes. So, so I can imagine now uh, the people here in the room in Berlin, they will all tell their grandchildren in 30 years. I was there on this day in October in Berlin, and there was this guy on this small stage in Berlin, Aravind Punch. This was, you, I mean, this was before his book launch, you know, <laughs> before he launched the book. I saw him on the stage here in Berlin. Uh, uh, and, and bringing you also the success that you, that you definitely... Uh, need uh, and also deserve uh, both both of those uh, both of those words I'm using on purpose uh, because of course you also need I mean next level platform which hopefully will become the book to to bring this even further into into the world I think that this is something that you're also hoping for right exactly so um, you know uh, the one of the big challenge in social enterprise. I mean, every every organization has challenge with money, right? You know, no, there's no one, even a billionaire wouldn't say that there's no challenge of money. But like the biggest challenge of social enterprise is we spend a lot of our time solving very uh, difficult social challenges, even though that is not our main work to do. But, you know, the challenges yeah. would come in all okay. different ways. For example, we had one girl. Uh, uh, she comes from a very, very underserved uh, Muslim community in Sri Lanka. And... Um, we wanted to uplift her. She wanted to become, a, you know, you know, space astronomer. And uh, in a, she was the first one who went to school in her community. And her mother brought and said, you know, we heard about you guys. You're uplifting people. Can you do that for my daughter? And then we did that. Uh, we d we put her in a in a in a first space program. You know, we have actually a space payload in the International Space Station. She was part of the program. And then we really want to give that exposure to her. But the certain group of people came and then how can you do that you know she has to be fully covered even though her, her and family was not really in, you know didn't have a problem and then we have to really stop doing what we are doing because of some certain social challenge in you know in in in, in that comes so this is uh, you know this is the the, the biggest part of uh, social enterprises but other than that you know as you said we always have to find ways to express and tell our, you know, now to we want our voices to be heard. As you said, this book will probably give an opportunity for that. You know, our voices are heard more, but it's always a challenge uh, everywhere we go that we have to ask for our right. Can you just even you know put us there? Can you give an opportunity to speak about it, even if we have? Uh, uh, maybe I'm not that attracted enough to be, you know, no, to be on a stage that you know they would they would easily come to me and say that I have to always ask, can you do that? You know, can you give me this? Even though I even even you know I know that you know we deserve. One of the example, you know, in the Falling Walls Award, uh, there were hundreds of application. Um, uh, we uh, applied and we were finalists. So I want to bring the whole team because this is a big empowerment for the youngsters. And our visas were rejected at the German embassy. I know that it's not the German part of German embassy did this. Um, they gave reasons that we don't have any reason to come to Germany, even though the letters were given from the German Ministry of Education, Robert Bosch, Bosch uh, Stiftung, like foundation. So many letters from Berlin and this and that. They said you don't have a real reason to come to Germany. And, and then, then, then he asked why, and they said, oh, no, your passports are fake. It's not actually true. And then we did a, a re remonstration, and, um, and they gave visa for one person. Just a day before the, 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 the big, big event, we flew, he flew all the way, and he went directly to the stage. There were 750 people of Nobel laureates and politicians and everyone. We pitched, and we won. Can you imagine that how many other people would have been denied this and they didn't win this thing. And then on the stage, I have to actually go and be a little bit political about this. I said that Germany might have demolished the wall within, but they should not build a wall around. And there are so many people, they have, not been, they have been denied this visa for reasons that actually does not make sense. So we always have to fight for these even fundamental things and fundamental rights everywhere, whether nationally or internationally.
So I think if you can help us, is the ba the best way to help us to, to you know tell our stories or invite us to speak about give these yeah. stories anywhere. Thank you. Well, I mean, you've definitely impressed all of us here today uh, present. And I mean, there's also many reasons to be super optimistic because last year at the Asia Berlin conference, I also think that you met the Sri Lankan uh, ambassador to uh, to Germany. And I mean, Actually, you, I you was the one who brought her to the summit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. well yeah. Uh, but I mean, you are also developing those kind of yeah, corporations, exactly. right? So you're getting the people involved. It was yeah. even you that yeah. that brought her there. Yes, that's a, that's you know, we we just uh, sometimes people don't believe in us because even though we show these things, we always need someone with an authority to say that's true. So one of our biggest ambassador, at least in the last month, is Princess of Luxembourg. So she has been like really supporting us in many things. So we need like you know common people and people with you know connections, people with authority to to just nominate us. You don't have to like you know say that. Just nominate us, and then we will come in and tell what we do. That's that's the biggest support we are looking for. That's why I said like you know here, you know what you can give is empower us. You know you don't have to give money. You don't have to give this. It's just empower us. Yeah. Okay. So final question. Uh, although uh, I would have like to continue this conversation but we have uh, we have other things coming up um you said the title of the book is it's called shifting lines so the, the shifting lines shifting lines it's called voice shifting line voice is the organization the publishing yeah they the voice of individual expression that's the voice itself mm -hmm. and uh they uh they will uh publish it on, on in, it'll go on amazon in on yeah. 16th of october but shifting lines meaning what so basically, this book is not only me. There are three more authors, co-authored, and their own stories. So every time, you know, this uh, this voice organization, uh, they choose a name and they just uh, they ah. chose this name. But my my story will be based on this, you know, co you know, like empowering the underserved communities. Uh, yeah, part of that book. Okay. But not a full book. Yeah, it's a part. Of, like my 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 story is like I'm saying, it's co-authored with three more people. So it's like, uh, you know. Yeah, people, well, people. I yeah. mean, there are many people who <laughs> never got even a chapter in, in a book. So, I mean, that is uh, actually great. And you also deserve it. And you also need it. And people yeah. hopefully ident identified your needs today. And hopefully uh, your presence here will also make a difference uh, afterwards. Exactly. And uh, also all the sales costs will go to Pen International yes. to support imprisoned yeah. writers. But we all know that nothing will keep you back and hold you back because you're a driving force behind the Dream Space Academy. Thank you so much for Thank your you. talk. Give it Thank up you. for Arvind Punch, ladies and gentlemen.